Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity we have today. Thank you for all that we have learned since the beginning of this Bible study. And thank you for the series we are going through now. We pray that you grant us wisdom from the study of your word. The wisdom that will make our lives profitable, joyful, happy and fruitful. We pray that you open our eyes of understanding and help us to have a purpose that will lead us in the right direction. Guide us in this matter of marriage. In Jesus' name, we pray. We're still continuing with the series on marriage for singles. Tonight we have here in our midst people that are already married. And some things that I say will just look like information to you. But please understand that even though they look like information, it may so happen that your wife or your husband is exactly what we're describing to these young people and single people about who to marry or who not to marry. And then that gives you some assignment that if your wife is just like the women that we describe to our single people, that probably they shouldn't have got married to people like that, then you know that you really need to pray. Then if we describe men that seem unsuitable or not ready, unprepared for marriage, and you are married and your husband looks like that, then you know that's a chance for you to really work on your husband by prayer, dedication, and faith in God. Then there are people here who are past the age of even thinking about family life, perhaps. They're so old, and maybe their wives have gone home to glory, or their husbands have gone home to glory. The things you learn will help your children, and you'll be able to tell your children, this is the way to get married. There are other people that are here who are single, and as you are single, you are looking up to the Lord that you should get married. It may so happen that you are now at the point of making decision on getting married. And I will go through with you on the word of God. And the things I read to you from the word of God, the Holy Spirit will take and apply in your heart. And it will guide you so that you will be able to prayerfully decide on who to get married to. But then it may so happen that you have given your hand in marriage already. You are not married yet. You are on the way. You are discussing. You are even giving your word. You are going ahead. And I may read some parts of the Bible to you today that comes to you as a shock, a surprise. And you say, if I knew that, I would have been slower in taking decision. Well, it's not too late yet. If the situation becomes so tense and so terrible and so difficult that the things I read to you bring fear in your heart that if I continue in the decision I've taken before, I might be plunging into a lifetime of heartache, affliction and misery. Then it means that you really need to adjust, you really need to pray, you need to kneel down and talk to the Lord God in heaven concerning the decision you have taken already. There's, there are some of you young people here. You are teenagers, 16, 17, 18 or thereabout. And the things I say, because of your age, will look funny to you. Or oh, you'll say that's the funniest Bible study I ever attended. Go ahead and enjoy yourself. Laugh all the way you can. Today you are so young. But as you laugh, thinking it's funny, try to jot down some notes. Who knows? Five years to this time, six years to this time, some of the things I say today, you suddenly wake up and you say, the pastor said that I met a man six years after that the pastor described six years ago. And so here we are today, old, married, single, young, marriageable, and unmarriageable teenagers. And all the things we learn, we're learning for our own lives. 
And here we are as counselors, zonal leaders, and coordinators, and ministers of the gospel, that many, many people pass through you because they respect you, they love you, they honor you. And they know that you have the word of life to share with them. And they feel that even if they don't understand, you understand. And you will be able to guide them. Though you are married as coordinators and zonal leaders and ministers of the gospel. Let's all pay attention. The things to learn will be very, very useful to the members of the church that come to counseling from you. Today, I'm dealing with the unprofitable union. And then, next Monday, I'll be dealing with God's partner for your life. If you miss, if you have missed already the last two messages I gave on God, our matchmaker, and God, still our matchmaker, you cannot afford to miss the next Monday Bible study. And if you know anyone who is not around today, he needs to be around next Monday as I look into the Bible with you on God's partner for your life. Now there are some Christians that they do not learn much about marriage before going into it. Surprisingly, some are even experienced and knowledgeable on other areas of the Christian life and yet they seem to be ignorant, blank on this important area of life. I'll be talking about John Wesley later and I'll talk about another stalwart Christian missionary, preacher, minister of the gospel, very, very dynamic and intelligent, but they made a mess of their marriages. There are people that marry in the dark. They do not want people to know about it. Other people marry without having any knowledge. They do not learn. They do not have instruction, counseling, or guidance. And they are in a tremendous gamble. Sudden marriage can be a step towards sudden death. And many people who go into the unprofitable union, they have already a sure guarantee for unprofitable, unfruitful life. I'll talk about commands on the unequal yoke. Two, I'll talk about characteristics of unmarriageable women. I'll talk about characteristics of unmarriageable men. And I'll talk about the catalog of unprofitable marriages. Let's come back to point one. Commands on the unequal yoke. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, reading from verse 1, When the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land, whither thou goest to possess it, and has cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites, and the Gergeshites, and the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than thou. And when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them, and shall, thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them. Neither shalt thou make marriages of them, thy daughter, thou shalt not give unto his son, nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son, for they will turn away thy son from following me, that they may serve other gods. So will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and destroy you suddenly. These people had just come out of the land of Egypt. About 40 years had passed. They spent a long time in the wilderness. But then that was like a short time because they had actually been in, in Egypt for centuries. And because they had been in Egypt for centuries, they knew nothing about marriage, proper marriage. They didn't have the opportunity of having a lawgiver, a teacher, a director, a counselor, a person that will show the way. But then Moses came to them, and the Lord used Moses and Aaron. And these people came out of the land of Egypt. Immediately they came out, they were concerned about pressing immediate needs. Those pressing needs were needs of food, and the needs of provision 
and the needs of protection. They were not immediately concerned about marriage. And so God gave them manna, and he guided them and protected them. Before long, they needed to understand how they will be able to get to the land of Canaan without perishing in the wilderness because the Amalekites came against them. The Lord fought for them and things were all right. But eventually, they needed to settle on this important area of marriage. And Moses assured them when they got to the land where they were going, there will be seven mighty nations, great, great nations that they will see. You see, when you are thinking about marriage, you think of the might, the greatness, the wealth, the intelligence of the person that will come across in your mind as a human being. You do not want somebody that is lower than yourself. You do not want somebody that is less to you in wealth or in anything. You want to get somebody that is mighty in your own definition wealthy in your own definition great in your own definition and moses told the people you might see these people and obviously depending on what you're looking at if you look at the natural if you look at the social if you look at the intellectual if you look at the temporary things they will seem greater and mightier but do not think about marriage towards them because they are idol worshippers they do not know the God of Israel. They're living in darkness. And it is the God of this world, the devil, that is ruling over them. If you get married to them, it will affect you, your, your faith. It will affect your belief in God. It will eventually affect the whole nation. And so they were warned they must not have the unequal yoke with those people. And the Lord is telling us the same thing today. That the unequal yoke will destroy the greatest thing in your life. Your faith in God. Your Christian faith, your Christian stand will definitely be affected. At a later time, before Joshua left the children of Israel. Again understand, Joshua had brought them to the borders of Canaan. And he had led them into victory. These were conquerors. They conquered Jericho. They conquered Ai. And also they got provision for themselves. They got houses they never built. And they got inheritance that they never worked for. But before this great man of God left them, he saw the necessity of talking to them on marriage. You might have come to the church and you're already a believer now. You've got eternal life. You've got healing. You've got prosperity. You've got a lot of things. But we do not want you to remain just with all those blessings you have got without getting an understanding on marriage. And here is the word of God again on the unequal yoke telling us you must never try it. Joshua chapter 23 from verse 11. Take good heed therefore unto yourselves that ye love the Lord your God else if ye do in any wise go back and cleave unto the remnant of these nations even these that remain among you and shall make marriages with them and go in unto them and dare to you know for a certainty that the Lord your God will no more drive out any of these nations from before you but they shall be snares and traps unto you scourges in your side tongues in your eyes until ye perish from all this good land which the Lord your God has given you. Have you. Do you remember any experience when you were very, very young, you did something wrong, and your parents wanted to discipline you, but in a harsh, hard, terrible way. And the, your parents, maybe your father, made you to remove all your clothes, and you were lying on the bench, and then with the scourge, the tail of an animal, sharp, strong, terrible, with all his adult strength, he laid that whip on your back, and because of the pain, you turned, and then it came on your side and your belly, the pain, the agony, the Bible says, when you marry an unbeliever, 
when you join yourself to these people, it will be like scourges in your naked side. And it will not only be for the 30 minutes of your father whipping you when you were young, but it can continue for 30 years. The nagging, the quarreling, the evil, the agony that you will experience all those years marrying the unbeliever. And it says, thorns in your eyes. Long ago, I met somebody that had an accident. And the broken glasses of the windscreen went into the eyeball. And um, even though he had taken care of himself, there were still some broken glasses in the eyeball when he was talking with me. And the inconvenience he felt every time he blinked his eyes. He felt the sharp pain in the eyes. You see what the Bible says here? That instead of just 30 minutes of the agony before the doctors work on you, if you marry the unbeliever, it will be like thorns in your eyeballs. And every time you blink, every time you try to think, Every time you try to do anything that will be profitable in your life, there will be so much pain and so much agony. Imagine if you can. Broken bottles in your eyeballs. Imagine if you can. A snare, a net around you. Imagine if you can. A soldier, powerful, mighty, with his adult strength, whipping you every day, morning, afternoon, and night. All that imagination is not up to the calamity and the trouble of marrying an unbeliever. And in the New Testament, in 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 14. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. When you read that in the city, you do not understand. But you see, in those days, they will bring two animals together and yoke them together by a piece of wood. Then they will tie the cart behind them, pulling the cart, pulling a load, or pulling the wagon. That yoke made them to work together, make them to live together, make them to go together. And marriage is like that. And that when you go to the altar, at the marriage altar, and they bring both of you together, the officiating minister is not just bringing your two hands together, it's bringing a yoke upon you to tie you together for life, to walk together, to plan together, to live together, to move together, to spend the rest of your life together. And it says that marriage yoke, that to take at the altar. It says, do not do it with an unbeliever. Be not unequally yoked together with, an unbe with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion has light with darkness? What concord has Christ with Belial? What part has he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? Listen to me. There are five words there that describe intimate marriage relationship. Look at the five words. Fellowship. Two, communion. Three, concord. Four, part. Five, agreement. You see, when you are getting into marriage, you are joining your two lives together to fellowship together you are creating a perpetual fellowship and friendship and then it says there is communion communion your life will enter into one another until you so communicate your life with that person she communicates her life to you on, until the two lives become a unit concord an agreement as well as partnership. And it says, if you are a believer, then you have righteousness, you are in the light, you are with Christ, you believe, then you are the temple of God. And then you must watch very clearly that your marriage arrangement doesn't have anything to do with the unrighteous, who is still walking in darkness and who has 
Belial or the God of this world as being his controller or who is an infidel. He has no faith that he holds on to, no living faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and is like an idol. The devil walking through him. And it says, for we are the temple of the living God and as God has said, I will dwell in them, I will walk in them, I will be their God and they shall be my people. Oh, you say, why didn't I hear this before? Because, you are saying, I already gave my word to somebody that is walking in darkness, to somebody that is unrighteous, to somebody that the God of this world, Belial, is controlling, to an infidel, and to somebody who is just like an idol. And it's not like the temple of the living God. But we have not married yet, but I gave him my word that I will consider him. Look at verse 17. It's not too late yet. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. If I do that, will God be happy with me? Oh, yes, he says, I will still receive you, and plan for you, and take care of your life. And will be a father unto you. And ye shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. You see, we are often short-sighted and thoughtless about the future consequences of our present actions. We say, I'll do it now. Like Samson, get her for me now. Because I love her. I want her. My body wants something now. Therefore, get her for me. Like Esau. I'm hungry now. Therefore, I must eat. Whatever the cost, whatever I pay for it later, give me the food right now. But to see, because we are short-sighted like that and we know nothing about the future consequences of our present actions, the Lord himself who knows the future of the heathen, the future of the sinners, the future of the religious hypocrites and pretenders, and the future of the nominal church goers, the children of Satan, he has given us warning. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers in his love, wisdom, and foresight. He has warned us his children not to marry unbelievers. Such marriage will become a snare, a net, a prison, a thorn in your side, and will bring God's fiery indignation and wrath and judgment on the backslider that goes to marry the unbeliever. But then you say, how do I know an unbeliever? Because these days, there are a lot of people that carry Bibles. There are a lot of people that wear badges. Apart from that, are there not unbelievers in our church here? Or are all these people that look nice and sitting gently, are they all believers, pastor? We are praying for them. That God will make them all believers. And we are trying our best. But at present, we don't have them 100% as believers. How then do I know? How then do I spot out the one that is a believer? One, you have to pray. You have to depend upon God. But two, after you have prayed, you can pray and yet make a mistake. Therefore, you really have to find out then, is this a believer? Is this an unbeliever? Then you'll need to find out what are the characteristics of unbelieving men, unbelieving women. Because you are not to marry an unbeliever. What are the characteristics of unmarriageable women? There are women who are unmarriageable. Somebody will marry them, some unlucky people, some unfortunate people, some unguided people. Some people that are not enlightened according to the word of God, they will marry them. Somebody will marry those unmarriageable women. But for you, you are enlightened. You are being counseled. You are being taught. You should not fall into the net of unmarriageable women. Women, don't worry about. Somebody may look at you and say, maybe you are the one I'm talking about. I'll soon talk to you about unmarriageable men. Some of the men are so unmarriageable, you won't believe it. But let's start with unmarriageable women. Proverbs chapter 2. From verse 10. When wisdom entereth into thine heart, and knowledge is pleasant unto thy soul, discretion shall preserve thee, and understanding shall keep thee. Verse 16. That discretion and wisdom will keep thee from the strange woman. 
even from the stranger which flattereth with her words, which forsaketh the guide of her youth, and forgetteth the covenant of her God. If you are wondering what type of woman is that, that is unmarriageable for me as a believer, you are told here, when discretion, wisdom, prudence enter into your heart, all these qualities will teach you that when you see a woman that flatters with her words, you should avoid that woman. Or the woman that has forsaken the guide of her youth and has forgotten the covenant of her God. She said, I used to be a believer. I used to be a Bible reader. I used to depend upon God. But you know, right now, I've broken my covenant relationship with the Lord. I want to get married first. After getting married, if I have time for God, I'll think about him. That's not a person for you to marry. Or somebody that will say, I used to read the Bible and find out the will of God in anything I wanted to do. And I will pray, and I'll be guided, and I will talk to the ministers of the gospel, and I will talk to those who are more knowledgeable in the things of the Lord than myself. But now I've given up that. I want to live my life now. I want to do what I like to do now. I do not want to get sight of any counselor, any guide, any Bible, any doctrine. I just want to get married to you. Run away from that woman. Because she has forsaken the covenant of God with her. And she had forgotten and forsaken the guide of her youth. In chapter 5, verse 3, Proverbs, The lips of a strange woman drop as an honeycomb, and mouth is smoother than oil. You meet a woman in your place of work, or in your community, or on the bus. You had never met her before. And then she sees you reading Bible, or she sees you giving out a tract, and eventually she came to you and said, Are you a believer? And you said, Yes, I'm a Christian. You answered gently. And he said, Oh, I just love you. I just praise the Lord for you. This time we met, and I've been looking for a person like you. In fact, you look so wonderful. Your Christian life is so gentle and so impressive. I think that uh, we should be friends together. By the way, what's your name? What's your address? Which church do you go? Oh, do you go to that church? I love that church very much. I read the Bible just like that. All these tracts you are giving out, I love the tracts as well. In fact, I love you. I hope we'll get married together. I love you. I'll take care of you more than your mother. I will help you every, all the days of my life. That's the woman you are to run away from. Talk, 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 talk. Her mouth is smoother than oil. But look at the next verse. Her feet go down to death. Her steps take hold on death. On hell. If you let her catch you, you are in for trouble. They are not as good as they talk. You do not know Christian believing women by talking too much. You know them by their humility and meekness and gentleness and sobriety. But the people that come to you and talk, talk, talk like that, you should be afraid of them. Look at verse 8. Remove thy way from her and come not nigh the door of her house. Lest thou give thine honor unto others and thy years to the cruel. Let strangers be filled with thy wealth, and thy labors be in the house of a stranger. And thou mourn at the last, when thy flesh and thy body are consumed, and say, How have I hated instruction, and my heart despises reproof, and I have not obeyed the voice of my teachers, nor inclined mine ear to them that instructed me. I'm instructing you and there are other teachers, counselors, and coordinators, and zonal leaders that are instructing you. Keep to the instruction of the word of God that we're all giving you. Because all those instructions are to rescue you from getting into the hand of a strange woman. Look at chapter 7, verses 4 and 5. Say unto wisdom, thou art my sister, and call understanding thy king's woman that they may keep thee from the strange woman, from the stranger which flattereth with her words. Beware of the woman that will flatter you. You know that you are not as good as she is painting you. And she is just flattering you so as to get you into her net. 
in uh, Proverbs chapter 9, verse 13. A foolish woman is clamorous. She is simple and knoweth nothing. Clamorous, noisy. Now, when you see a woman that there's nothing around her, there's nothing about her except her tongue, her lips, and mouth, that's all you see about her. Every time you come together, she doesn't allow any other person to talk. She has a lot to say. A lot of foolish things that are just empty words, loud, empty noise. You ought to avoid that woman like you avoid a snake. In chapter 21 of Proverbs, verse 9, It is better to dwell in the corner of the house top than with a brawling woman in a white house. 19, It is better to dwell in the wilderness with, than with a contentious and an angry woman. Now, what the Bible is saying here is that you young people, unmarried people, before you get married, you say, I feel lonely. I feel as if I'm living in the wilderness. I have no wife yet. I have no comforter yet. I have no helper yet. I have no fiancé yet. I do not have a life partner yet. And all the time you're saying, any woman that comes along my, my way, I'll just get that woman. But look, it is better that you remain single now and watch carefully uh, more than if you get into the net of a brawling, noisy, quarrelsome, fighting woman. And it says it's better to remain in the wilderness, lonely, not married yet, not having a fiancé yet, rather than having a contentious, angry woman. You have not married yet, but you see her in the zone. And she says she is um, a child of God. That's what everybody likes to be. And then she fights with the house fellowship. And you say, ah, house fellowship is also like the house of God. Yes, I know, but I need to teach her. That lady teaching house fellowship, I need to teach her sense. And then eventually, uh, you say, have you seen the area leader? Which area leader? I don't count with those people. The only two people I love, I love you and I love the pastor. Only those two people in the whole church. Be afraid of those women. Contentious, angry, terrible, they are temper, they are terrible, more than a lion or a bear. And so the word of God is saying, it is better still to remain single and praying, finding out who you will get married to, than get married to that person that will destroy you in your life. In chapter 22, verse 14, the mouth of a stray of strange women is a deep pit. He that is abhorred or rejected of the Lord shall fall therein. I pray you will not fall in the hands of a strange woman in Jesus' name. It's not only women that can be bad. Some men too, oh, they can be bad and they can be terrible. And that's why it's good for you to understand that you should marry just believers, believers alone. All these references I read to you, they describe the characteristics of unbelieving men and unbelieving women. Look at Proverbs again, chapter 2, verse 10. When wisdom entereth into thine heart and knowledge is pleasant unto thy soul, discretion shall preserve thee, understanding shall keep thee, to deliver thee from the way of the evil man, from the man that speaketh forward things, who leave the paths of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness. If you see that there is a man, you never see him in the afternoon. And it is not that he's a medical doctor on call. It's not that he's working in the hospital or he's working as a guard or security somewhere in the night. And he's doing work somewhere, but it's always in the night. Then you should know that he belongs to a gang. And if you are not careful, the person might say, well, I'm a Christian, because he's looking for somebody to marry. And he's going the ways of darkness. They rejoice to do evil. They delight in the forwardness of the wicked, whose ways are crooked, and they forward in their paths. And you shouldn't marry such a person, a night marauder. Person, nocturnal person, that... It's only in the night that he operates. During the day, he's relaxing. 
and walking about and yet he spends money and you wonder where does this man work and get all this money lazy sleeping loitering during the day and working during the night if you marry such a person he'll take care of you with the money that he gets from blood and then you will not be clean your hands too will be full of blood in proverbs chapter 4 from verse 14 enter not into the path of the wicked go not in the way of evil men avoid it pass not by it turn from it and pass away you not even allow them to have your address do not get into such acquaintance and such friendship with them talking terms with them to the point that they are telling you that they are interested in you because they are not marriageable they are evil they are deceitful and their ways are shifting from here and there or here to there in chapter 14 verse 7 chapter 14 verse 7 go from the presence of a foolish man when thou perceivest not in him the lips of knowledge now what knowledge do you have as a believing sister as a child of god a woman you have knowledge of god you have knowledge of christ as being your savior you have knowledge of the bible as being the word of god you have knowledge of eternity you have knowledge of life after death you have knowledge of the fact that we ought to live among the children of god and you have knowledge of living a peaceable life in the fruit of the spirit and you come in contact with a man he says he comes to church he says he reads the bible he says that he too is a believer but as we discuss with him he has no knowledge of the savior he has no knowledge of god he has no knowledge of the bible the moment you discover that you know you are dealing with an unbeliever go from the presence of that foolish man the moment you perceive that he does not have the lips of knowledge if you marry such a person you are marrying an unbeliever verse 14 the backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways a man that is filled with his own ways is the wisest person that you have ever met that's what he says you are discussing something and now he tells you that he's looking at you and he knows the will of god to you and you say well brother have you gone to see the marriage committee and he says no have you seen the have you seen the zona leader no have you seen the coordinators no have you seen the pastor no have you seen anybody no why are you asking me that why do i need to see them a person as i am all those people that are teaching inside the scripture preaching on monday preaching on thursday apart from the pastor i know more than all those people and all those people they make coordinator make zona leader make a state overseer make missionary i know more than all those people and tell him to coach bible he doesn't know bible he knows more than the coordinators tell him to pray he doesn't know how to pray he knows more than the coordinators he has gone for interview three times so they can make him house fellowship leader he has failed all the three times the person that failed that interview three times he knows more than all our coordinators go from the presence of that man that's a fake man that's a counterfeit that's a pretender that's a hypocrite the backslider in heart is filled with his own ways or you are going on together maybe you have even said okay uh, i am praying about knowing about this will of god and eventually has not even allowed you to finish praying will visit you every day and every time he comes he never talks about any other thing he talks about himself if you knew my bank account if you knew my parents if you knew what i did when i was in primary school if you know how great i was did you know that i was a great athlete oh i could run overrun everybody in fact i almost won national award in my running and at, in athletes now he'll talk about just himself now did you go to church on sunday did you hear those sisters singing did you hear the choir singing i can sing more than that did you hear that brother that prayed i can pray more than that did you hear the person that answered sir, the scripture question i can answer more than that did you hear the people that are doing those little little oh i can do more than that filled with his own ways if you can do more than that why are you not doing anything well i just don't have the chance now run away from them and they just go about bragging they say they are born again they say they are children of god they are filled with their own ways 
they will not accept counseling or direction. Verse 17. He that is sown angry, dealeth foolishly. A man of wicked devices is hated. A man that you are just discussing little things. Let us meet at the bus stop. Yes, I'll meet you there. And then as you, wa as you wanted to go, a sister met you and said, Ah, sister, how are you? And then you were five minutes late to get to the bus stop. And this man has been waiting. You are not married yet. It's just talking about, will I marry you? Will you marry me? And you were five minutes late. You got to the bus stop. And in front of all the people at the bus stop there said, Where are you coming from now? You think I'm an animal? I'm your, I'm your servant. I'm your slave. I've been waiting here for five minutes. And you are just coming now. Next time you do that, I will disgrace you publicly and slap you. And I will go back to God and pray for salvation again. When you see a man like that, that will, you have not married yet, and that person will put you to public shame at the bus stop. You should just write a note and say bye-bye. I thank God who has allowed me to know you more. Verse 17, look at it again. He that is soon angry, dealeth foolishly. You discuss a little matter, he's angry already. You are talking on just a small point, he's angry already. And maybe you you said, uh, he said, I didn't come to Bible study yesterday. Can you give me your outline? And then you said, well, it's even in my Bible here. And I even jot some notes down there. And then you gave the outline to him. He's angry. It's me you are giving something to like that. You didn't kneel down before me. My mother didn't do that to my father. Every time my mother will give something to my father, she will kneel down on two legs like this, on two knees. And you give me Bible study outline. You didn't kneel down. Get your Bible study outline. Say, thank you, sir. No more marriage. Go and pray. We didn't know the will of God properly. That person, if you get married, because of outline, he wants you to kneel down. You'll be kneeling down even on the road. The car will crush you. They want you to kneel down every time. If you give them water to drink, you kneel down. You give them paper, you kneel down. Anything you are giving them, you kneel down. It doesn't matter on the road or in the house or right in the church. You must kneel down every time. I'm afraid of those men. I hope you are afraid of them too. Now you see, as we read all these references in the word of God, they may seem funny, but let's take care. Because the word of God is very important. Chapter 16, verse 5. Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. And when you marry a proud man, you are marrying an abomination. And it says, though hand join in hand, he shall not be unpunished. Verse 27. An ungodly man diggeth up evil. In his leaves there is a burning fire. This person came to you and said, well, sister, I am wanting to marry you. And I prayed, I've known the will of God. Well, you say, brother, I've not prayed yet. So I cannot tell you now yes or no. I will pray. But before I pray, I want to tell you in my life, this happened five years ago, this happened two years ago, this happened three years ago, because uh, maybe you didn't know that, and now you are saying you want to marry me. I want you to know all these things, so that nothing is strange to you. And he said, okay, uh, still go and pray all the same. And then two weeks after that, he saw you at the Bible study. And you have not given your word. You are not saying you are marrying him. Only that you just said you want to be sincere. This is what you had been in the past. And she says, sister, come here. That thing you told me uh, two weeks ago. In fact, what's your answer now? Have you accepted or not? Well, I'm still praying. You only told me two weeks ago. Haven't you finished praying? Two weeks. You know how many hours we'll have in one week? One sixty-eight. You know how many hours we have in two weeks? All those hours you have not prayed and you have not found the answer to give me. Well, I'm still praying. In any case, that thing you told me, you didn't tell me everything. I went to uh, Shagamo to find out. And I saw Mr. So-and-so. I saw Mrs. So-and-so. Ah, that thing I told you two weeks ago, just being sincere, to tell you that this is my life. You went to find out, oh yes, I find out everything. I dig up everything like a policeman, like a CID. The Bible says that an ungodly man diggeth up evil. He will not bury it. He doesn't have real love in the heart. All he wants, he wants somebody that he can satisfy his bodily pleasures on. That's why he wants to marry you. 
And a person like that should be afraid of a person like that. Quarrelsome, difficult, dangerous, and is deadly as well. And in Proverbs chapter 20, Proverbs chapter 20, from verse 1. Wine is a mocker, strong drink a raging, is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. You get to the house of a man, and he drinks. And you say, ah, brother, do you drink? What sort of question is that? Are you watching, are you watching my life? Are you suspecting me? Do you drink? What if I drink? Suppose I tell you I drink now. What, will you, what conclusion will you make out of that? Do you think, okay, if you say I drink, I drink. How about those bottles that are there? I say, if you say I drink, I drink. That's what you want to hear? Okay, I drink. You know, you see how clever he is? He's a prospective drunkard. Is going on the road to drunkenness, but he doesn't want to confess it. And he's putting it back to you that if you say, I drink, I drink. He's not sincere. And he's not serious about marrying you. He just wants, wants to bring you into slavery. Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. Alcohol is one of the greatest sins that destroy marriage, break up marriage. And therefore, you should beware of the man that is still drinking, drinking in secret, but will not confess age. And then in Proverbs, chapter 23, verse 21, For the drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty. Drowsiness shall clothe a man with rags. You can read all the other references on your own. I've shown you in all these references that there are men that are marriageable. There are women that are marriageable. Now let me talk a little bit on the catalog of unprofitable marriages. There's no time to read all the references with you, but let me just read one. Exodus chapter 2. Exodus chapter 2. From verse 16. Now the priests of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water and filled the troughs to water their father's flock. And the shepherds came and drove them away. But Moses stood up and helped them and watered their flock. And when they came to Ruel, their father, he said, How is it that ye are come so soon today? And they said, An Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds, and also drew water enough for us and watered the flock. And he said unto the daughters, Where is he? Why is it that he left the man? He called call him, and that he may eat bread. Moses was content to dwell with the man. And he gave Moses Zipporah his daughter. No prayer. No finding the will of God. No counseling. No finding about the woman. Just at this time, living there, the man said, I'll be happy to give you my daughter. Oh, yes, I'll be happy to marry your daughter. That's how they got married. How was the marriage? It did not favor the call of Moses. It did not favor the life of Moses. It did not favor the happiness, the joy of the life of Moses. Look at Exodus chapter 4. From verse 24. And it came to pass by the by the way, in the inn, that the Lord met Moses and sought to kill the child because the child had not been circumcised. Then Zipporah took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her son and cast it at his feet and said, Surely a bloody husband had thou to me. And he said, let, And he let him go. And then she said, A bloody husband thou art because of the circumcision. What happened is that Moses had known about the circumcision from the teaching that they had been given in the family. God had told Abraham, every male child must be circumcised. But he married this woman, unbeliever, a Midianite. And the man wanted to circumcise the child. The woman said, not on your life. Only over my dead body will you do that. But you see, in our religion, we should circumcise the male child. That's your religion. I married you, not your religion. If you touch that boy, 
and you circumcise that boy, and I know about it. I will deal with you. Now you think about this. Moses was a powerful, bold, fearless man. When he saw those Egyptians, uh, uh, that Egyptian fighting with an Israelite, he killed the Egyptian, bold and powerful, mighty and fearless. When he saw those people that were fighting, the Israelites said, why are you fighting a man that was bold and will talk to you straight? But then this Zipporah, the wife, was no match for, he was no match for that wife. And when he said, I'd like to circumcise the child, he said, if you do it, you've never seen trouble before. And so Moses, not wanting trouble anymore, he just kept quiet. Now when the judgment was to come on that child, then that woman just took a sharp stone, bold. He said, okay, my husband, you can do it now. He said, I can do it myself. And cut off the foreskin and threw it angrily at the feet of Moses and said, bloody husband. Think about a minister marrying like that. The lawgiver marrying like that. A great preacher marrying like that. And Moses had to send her back to the father-in-law. Later, she came back. But there is no record that they really lived a happy marital life. I told you that I'll talk to you on some people that were great Christians. Let me talk to you about two people today. Later, I may talk to you about others. William Carey was a brilliant missionary linguist. Linguistics. Bible translator, pioneer, and a remarkable man by all standards, and yet his marriage was terrible, woeful. He got married to a woman, Dorothy, and there wasn't much about their courtship. It looked like it was just a marriage of convenience that I'm old enough now to marry, and I'll be happy with a woman, but they were totally different. William Carey was different from Dorothy. Now, what's the difference? Where William Carey was an intelligent fellow, a person that actually had very much affinity or interest in academics, and he had spiritual goals and aspirations, and also his disposition, conduct, and character was just wonderful. On the other hand, this woman was an uncultured illiterate. Think about the man. The man studied Greek, Latin, Hebrew, French, Dutch, so that he can be able to translate the Bible in the original language to the languages of the Indians. And he also studied some Indian languages as well. And the woman herself was a total illiterate. She had difficulty learning the English alphabets. And this man, Bible translator, this man, a great preacher, this man, a great missionary, got married to this woman, a total illiterate. Many times the woman will be moody dejected, depressed. Many times, she'll be stubborn and unyielding. And William Carey was going on with that in the family. Eventually, William Carey accepted the call to go on missionary field. The woman said, I'm not going, and the children will not go with you. Eventually, William Carey said, if all the children, three children cannot go, can I take the first child and go? So they arranged that he would take the first child and go to India on missionary work. But a friend of William Carey went to convince Dorothy that she should go. And she said, if I'm going, I'll go with the children and I will go with another sister of mine, Kitty. Eventually, they went to India. But it was a terrible time and a terrible marriage it was. Eventually, the woman became almost mentally imbalanced. And the trouble at home disturbed William Carey so much even though God still helped him to do some work, he would have done more if the marriage had been right. John Wesley, on the other hand, was a holiness preacher, great Bible expositor, and he was the founder of the Methodist Church, but the marriage was a tragedy. John Wesley had major weakness in choosing a life partner. He had wanted to marry a particular woman, Miss Hopke, when he went to preach in evangelistic work in Georgia, a colony um, in America at that time. And Hopke had a relative that was a magistrate. Eventually, when things could not work out and Wesley could not marry Miss Hopke, then, and he dropped this lady. This lady talked to the magistrate and they found some things as a case on John Wesley and drove him out of Georgia and he couldn't continue his preaching. At that time, William, um, 
John Wesley just did not think about marriage anymore. It was a great blow. About 15 years later, John Wesley started talk, thinking about marriage again. What happened is that John Wesley got sick. And he was taken to the orphanage in Newcastle to be taken care of. And there was this lady, Grace Murray, that started taking care of him. And John Wesley, without prayer, without finding out the will of God, got interested in that woman again. Wanted to marry Grace Murray. But Charles Wesley, the junior brother of John Wesley, knew about that plan. And he saw that John Wesley did not know how to make the right choice. And he hindered John Wesley in getting married to that uh, woman. Eventually, John Wesley saw another woman, a widow, having three children already. Think about a person that was the leader over the whole of the Methodist church. A person that had many, many people that had been saved and sanctified. Having difficulty in choosing to get a life partner. And eventually, God, this widow, and having the woman had three children and a good income. And before, John, before Charles Wesley knew about the plan, before George Whitfield knew about the plan, John Wesley had quickened all the steps and had gotten married. And after he got married, it was the most terrible thing that John Wesley ever did for himself. The woman was terrible. Apart from the fact that the woman privately will get angry, will fight, will quarrel. They, sometimes he will take John Wesley by the air on the head and be pulling John Wesley around in the house like that. But John Wesley will never talk because he was preaching sanctification. Not only that, he will take all his letters. When letters come to John Wesley for counseling, she will take all the letters and read all the letters and then will be holding on to some letters. There was a particular woman called Sarah. That woman, Sarah, was living a particular distance from John Wesley. But this woman had believed on the Lord and had become sanctified. And this woman will write for counseling from John Wesley. The wife will take that letter and fold it. When they go to the church, the wife will call women in the church and say, Come, John Wesley, holiness preacher, I have this letter in my hand. I won't read the content to you, but bad, bad things that are there. John Wesley is deceiving you. He's a hypocrite. He'll be going like that to people. At the beginning, when John Wesley started going about, when they got married, John Wesley will take her on an evangelistic tour. And then over there, while John Wesley is preaching, after the preaching, instead of counseling and leading people aright, he will be calling people on the evangelistic field over there and say, Come. You hear him, he can talk, he can preach, but I know his secret and his wife. Look at this letter. He, he will not read, she will not read the letter to her. She will just say, look at this letter. If you see what is there, you will never believe that man again. And then eventually, she will leave house and go and not say, my husband John Wesley, this is where I am going. She will go away for some months. Later, she will come back again. You tell me, how was John Wesley eating at that time? How was he taking care of himself at that time? Eventually, the wife just left. And they, John Wesley did not know where he had, she had gone. And in 1781, somebody far, far away wrote to John Wesley and said, Your wife has died. That's how the life of John Wesley went in the marital life. Think about it. Are you wiser than William Carey? Who understood Greek, Latin, Hebrew, French, Dutch, Indian languages and translated the Bible from Hebrew and Greek to Indian languages and he made a mistake in marriage. Are you wiser than John Wesley? Who wrote commentary on the whole Bible? Who preached terrible, powerful doctrines and made a mistake in marriage? That's why you need to pray. And we need to pray. Rise up. Let's talk to the Lord. That we will not make mistakes in our marriages in Jesus' name. Do not allow anybody to pull you to the un unprofitable union. Call upon the Lord. That God will help you. God will assist you. God will protect you from evil men, from evil women. Do not let your flesh push you. Do not let anybody deceive you. God loves you. God will take care of you. God will choose for you. Depend upon God, my brother. Depend upon God, my sister. Let the Lord himself choose for you.
look up to the Lord in prayer. That God will make your wife the right type of person she ought to be. God will make your husband the right type of person that he ought, he ought to be. Marriage is a serious, serious matter. Do not rush. Do not do something in the dark. Do not do it secretly. Members of the church love you. The coordinators and the zonal leaders and our leaders in the church, we are all here so as to help you and protect you. Do not hide your marital plans from your leaders in the church. Once you have got in that woman, once you have got in that man, it's for life. Let the Lord direct you in prayer before you do it. 